order. If, if people who are le- order. If people who are leaving the chamber could please do so quickly and quietly, we can attend to the terms of the statement from the Secretary of State. I think there is now something approaching calm. The Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am delighted that my first statement as the Business and Energy Secretary is on a subject that matters so much to every member of this House and also to every person on the planet. As we heard from a 16-year-old girl, Greta Thunberg, it is vitally important to act now so our children and grandchildren have a bright future ahead of them. We only have this planet and it is all of our duty to do everything we can, cross-party, cross-country and cross-world, to leave it in a better place than we found it. So today, with permission, I would like to make a statement on the UN Climate Action Summit in New York that took place on Monday this week. The Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for International Development joined the UN Secretary General, world leaders, key figures from business, industry and civil society at the UN Climate Action Summit on Monday. The science is clear about the speed, scale and cost to lives and livelihoods of the climate crisis that is facing us. Costs show that the total global damages from climate-related events were more than $300 billion in 2017 alone. And we know that globally emissions are continuing to rise year on year. And with tragic impact, we also know that the world's most vulnerable are being hit hardest by the impacts of climate change. Natural disasters are already pushing 26 million people a year into poverty, with hundreds of millions of people potentially facing major food shortages in the coming decade. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and other world leaders met because they are determined to take decisive collective action to cut emissions and to improve the resilience of countries and communities. And the Prime Minister showed very clearly what decisive climate action looks like at home and abroad. In the UK, we have cut emissions by 42% since 1990, while growing the economy by 72%. Cutting our use of coal in our electricity system from almost 40% to only 5% in just six years. And leading the world in deployment of clean technologies like offshore wind. In just that one renewable sector, the UK is home to almost half the world's offshore wind power. We became the first country in the G20 to legislate for net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And we're already seeing that thousands of jobs are being created as part of this transition. Almost 400,000 people are employed in the low carbon sector and its supply chains, a number that we plan to grow to 2 million by 2030. We're also playing a critical part on the world stage. In his closing speech, the Prime Minister set out his determination to work together with others to tackle the climate crisis. He called for all countries to increase their 2030 climate ambition pledges under the Paris Agreement and confirmed that the UK will play our part by raising our own nationally determined contribution by February next year. And to help developing countries go further and faster, we also committed to double the UK's international climate finance from 5.8% billion to £11.6 billion over the period 2021 to 2025. This funding will support some of the most vulnerable communities in the world to develop low carbon technologies and to shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, helping replace, for example, wood burning stoves and kerosene lamps that are used by millions of the world's poorest families with sustainable and more reliable technologies like solar power for cooking, heating and lighting. This new funding will also help our incredible rainforests and mangroves, which act as vital carbon sinks 
and help restore degraded ecosystems like abandoned land, which were once home to forests, mangroves and other precious habitats. So many of us have been glued to David Attenborough's incredible Blue Planet and Planet Earth series, which really bring home the scale of destruction and the need for global action. Doubling our international climate finance will help those most vulnerable deal with the damaging effects of climate change and to become more resilient. And, Mr Speaker, on Monday, as a part of the International Climate Finance Commitment, the Government clearly put technology at the heart of our response, with a new £1 billion Ayrton Fund to drive forward clean energy innovation in developing countries. The fund is named after the British physicist and suffragette, Herta Ayrton, whose work at the beginning of the 20th century inspired the Ayrton anti-gas fans that saved lives during the First World War. This is new funding that leading scientists and innovators from across the UK and the world can access, saving lives in the future, as Herta Ayrton's work did over a century ago. And our Prime Minister is not alone in taking action. We led on the summit's adaptation and resilience theme with Egypt and delivered a powerful call to action joined by 112 countries. As part of this, we launched a first-of-its-kind coalition for climate resilient investment to transform infrastructure investment by integrating climate risks into decision-making, ensuring that, for example, roads and bridges are built, taking into account climate risk. We also launched a new risk-informed early action partnership which will help keep a billion people safer from disaster by greatly improving early warning systems of such dangerous events as floods and hurricanes, giving people vital extra hours, days and even weeks to prepare for them. Mr Speaker, we were delighted that 77 countries, 10 regions and 100 cities committed at the summit to net zero by 2050. We saw the incoming Chilean COP25 presidency announcing a climate ambition alliance of 70 countries, each signalling their intention to submit enhanced climate action plans or nationally determined contributions. And businesses are taking action too. Over 50 financial institutions pledged to test all of their $2.9 trillion in assets for the risks of climate change. And nine multilateral development banks committing to support global climate action investments by targeting $175 billion in annual financing by 2025. But, Mr Speaker, the Climate Action Summit was by no means an end in itself. It was a call for global action, one that the UK and many others heeded. We cannot and we will not be complacent. Coming out of the summit, the combined commitments of all those countries and all of that goodwill still does not put us on track to meet the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. People right across the country and right across the world are every day sending a clear message that we all must go further. And as the Secretary General said, time is running out. Globally, much more is needed. The UK, as an acknowledged world leader in tackling climate change and as the nominated host for COP26 in 2020, now has a unique opportunity to work with countries and businesses across the world, to build on the foundations laid at this week's summit, to drive this action agenda forward and to turn the tide of emissions growth. There is no other planet. This is it, and we must look after it. Thank you. Thank you. Just before I call the Shadow Secretary of State, it might be helpful to the House if I indicate an intention to move on at 10 to 2. 10 to 2. Barry Gardner. Thank you, sir. First of all, I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of her statement. Mr Speaker, the climate emergency is worse than we feared. Yesterday, the IPCC published their special report on oceans and the cryosphere, which set out the dangers starkly. Sea levels threatening nearly a billion people living in low-lying coastal regions and tipping points in the permafrost that could release hundreds of billions of tonnes of carbon. This report makes clear yet again 
that we must do everything to reduce emissions as fast as possible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, beyond which climate breakdown will be catastrophic. The purpose of the UN Climate Action Summit was to spur on greater climate ambition towards this aim. But none of the world's large polluters met this challenge. China, India and the EU all were unable to announce tougher NDCs. Brazil and the USA refused even to turn up. Our country must now step forward to fill this vacuum of political leadership on the world stage. The UK's commitments at the summit need close scrutiny. The new Ayrton Fund that the Government has announced allocates one billion to help British scientists and innovators create new clean technology. That's great. But this funding has come from the aid budget. We shouldn't be siphoning off overseas development assistance to spend on UK universities and firms. That should be funded from non-ODA finance. So can the Secretary of State explain why this funding is diverting precious resources from mitigation in climate vulnerable nations? And if the Minister claims this money is classified as aid because it will help export clean technologies, to the developing world, perhaps you can today commit to follow Labour's lead and pledge to provide to the citizens of the Global South free or cheap access to green technologies that we develop here. Yeah, yeah. The Government's pledge to double international climate finance, again welcome, also raises questions. Can the, can the Secretary of State confirm that this money will be dispersed predominantly through grants? rather than loans which unfairly saddle the poorest nations with debt in order to pay the costs of a problem that they did very little to cause. Climate change is already wreaking hundreds of billions of dollars in damages on these communities. Will the Secretary of State commit to devoting any of these resources to cover loss and damage caused by climate disasters? After all, this government is perpetuating the fossil fuel economy for the poorest nations abroad, completely undermining our international climate finance. From 2013 to 18, UK export finance gave £2.6 billion in export support to the energy sector, 96% of it to fossil fuel projects, overwhelmingly in low- and middle-income countries. So will the Secretary of State today commit to ending taxpayer support for fossil fuels abroad, as so many other countries have done? Because what we do abroad matters more than ever. The UK is hosting the UN Climate Conference, COP26, in Glasgow next year, the most important climate summit since the Paris Agreement. The Right Honourable Member for Devises is President of COP26. But COP presidents are normally ministers in their government, and she has indicated her intention to stand down at the next election. So I would ask the government, what staffing resources will the office of the COP president be provided with? How much funding does the government intend to provide to COP26 preparations? What regular reports will the COP president be able to give to cabinet? And what objectives has the COP president been set by the cabinet? These resources must be devoted, because at COP26 we will need to use our diplomatic leverage to persuade other nations to bring forward much tougher NDCs. And I'm deeply concerned that staffing levels are inadequate. In 2009, under the Labour government, the Foreign Office had an army of climate staff 277 strong. Seven subsequent years of austerity halved that. When this Prime Minister was Foreign Secretary, the number of officials working full-time on climate change fell to just 55. Does the Government intend to restore the workforce to levels last seen a decade ago in recognition of the huge diplomatic resource that is now required to support the agenda of a UK-led COP26? The failures of the UN Climate Action Summit raised the stakes of that COP so much higher. We cannot afford for these talks or those at COP25 in Chile to stumble. The issue of climate breakdown is far greater than the party political divides that afflict this parliament. 
and I do urge all members of this House to find common ground in the pursuit of a healthy and stable climate. And in this spirit, I offer to the Secretary of State that I and my colleagues in the Labour Party are fully committed to doing everything we can in a cross-party manner to ensure that COP26 delivers the very highest possible ambition. Yeah. Well, can I, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman opposite, and he and I have... Thank you. Uh, he and I have worked together on energy issues some years ago also, and I certainly welcome his willingness to work cross-party on this issue, which I know he cares a great deal about and he is extremely knowledgeable on. And I would also like to pay tribute to his right honourable friend, the member for Doncaster North, for his excellent efforts on the Climate Change Act of 2008, from which so much of the UK's ambition in this space has led. And I absolutely encourage him to work cross-party I'll be delighted to meet with him and his colleagues to discuss how we can take this forward in a shared endeavour to tackle global climate change. He asked some very specific questions, and I will seek to answer them all. If I can't or have missed some, I'm delighted to meet and, and tackle them further. In terms of the, the uh, recent report on the IPCC report on the ocean and the cryosphere, he's absolutely right. This, this report does provide the best available science on the wide range of impacts of climate change on the ocean and the cryosphere and potential measures for building resilience to those impacts is something that um, the government welcomes. We're very concerned about the impact of climate change on the oceans and of course as an island, as an island nation, the United Kingdom, its overseas territories, our Commonwealth partners and close friends are especially dependent on a healthy and sustainably managed ocean. So we will be looking very carefully at those uh, recommendations. He asks about the fact that the tougher NDCs weren't met at the climate summit, and he's right to, to raise that point. He'll be aware that those targets are supposed to be raised by February next year. The UK is committed to do that, and we will, of course, be urging all others to raise their NDCs by next February. Um, he asks about the Ayrton Fund and its use for um, scientific work um, coming out of overseas development aid. And what I can say to him is that in the government's recently published Green Finance Strategy, we committed to aligning all UK overseas development aid with the Paris Agreement so that all of our development finance is consistent with climate resilient and low greenhouse gas development pathways. But it is, of course, essential because so much of the problem um, for vulnerable communities overseas is it related to climate change. So those things are inextricably linked. But again, I'll be happy to speak to him more about that. He asks about grants versus loans. I can tell him almost all grants. And again, we can speak further about that. He asks about fossil fuel export finance. And as he will know, the Committee on Climate Change has made very clear that actually to achieve net zero does require a transition through uh, lower carbon fossil fuels. And I would just point again to the fact that in just the last six years, we've gone from a 40% reliance on coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel, to today only, a, uh, only, only 6%, 5%, I'm sorry. And that is quite an achievement. There's much more to be done. But we do recognise that there will be the need for ongoing use of fossil fuels during that transition period. He asked about staffing resources for COP26. He will be aware that the um, President was, uh, is a prime ministerial appointment, and I shall be working very closely with the Honourable Member for Devises, the Right Honourable Member for Devises, um, as COP President, making sure that all of the parliamentary updates will be um, made available on time and working closely cross party. And just, I just want to finish up by saying the UK has a huge ambition for decarbonisation and for retaining our global leadership in tackling global climate change. Sarah Newton. Speaker, I very much welcome the um, determination which the Secretary of State has communicated to us because this is the greatest challenge that we face as a country and I'm sure we can maintain the excellent radical consensus achieved by the, men the member for Doncaster North through the Climate Change Act that this remains above party politics. Everyone so in the country true. will expect us to do that. And on the road to COP26, 
Would my right hon. Friend assure me that there will be roadshows and lots of opportunities for businesses and enterprises, the length and breadth of the country, who are coming up with the solutions that will enable not only us here at home to meet our net zero carbon, but so many developing nations around the world? Yes, my honourable friend is exactly right. It will be very important that during 2020 we spend a good amount of time promoting not only the work that government is doing in supporting, but also the brilliant ideas from UK scientists and the efforts around the world to try and improve tackling global climate change. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of the statement and welcome her to her position. Uh, this, uh, this statement is, uh, is focused on the international situation, but we are in a climate emergency. And while, whilst what we do abroad matters, what we do here is even more important. In Scotland, yesterday's landmark legislation passed its final stage in the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government has responded and now has the toughest statutory target of any country in the world to reduce emissions by 75 per cent by 2030. Uh, soon to generate 100 per cent of power through renewable uh, sources and planting 85 per cent of the trees across the UK, pushing ahead on insulation. Scotland is committed to becoming net zero by 2045, five years before the rest of the UK, and in line with the advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change, whose recommendations are contingent on the UK becoming net zero by 2050. To hit the same, UK policies will therefore need to be ramped up significantly. It falls short on home and business energy efficiency. It is way behind on carbon capture, utilisation and storage. Decarbonisation of the gas grid must be accelerated. It must flatten the pedal on vehicle and tax incentives to prom promote low carbon choices. And VAT must be reduced on energy efficiency improvements. Her government must remove her, their ideological opposition to renewable onshore wind and stop yeah, yeah, holding yeah, yeah, yeah. solar power back. Yeah, yeah. The Secretary of State is new in post, so will she therefore commit to pre presenting a clear plan and target to address these issues? Finally, yesterday, buried amongst other news, was the revelation that the cost of Hinkley C yeah. nuclear power plant, already the most expensive development on this planet, will rise by nearly £3 billion. <laughs> The UK Government should not be pouring money down this bottomless pit of new nuclear when onshore wind, for example, is now less than half Honourable for consumers. I mean, Will she take I mean, action on this? Deeply grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. Secretary of State. Uh, well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for a raft of points. I'll try and tackle them all. First of all, I congratulate the uh, Scottish Government for their work in, in also legislating to achieve net zero by 2045. And of course, they, as the UK Government are, are following the advice and recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change. And we will need to work together to ensure that we all meet those targets. He asks whether there will be a clear plan and pathway for net zero. There absolutely will be. My department is working flat out to provide particular pathways for us to consult on. He raises the issue of the clean growth strategy and I can tell him that the Committee on Climate Change are clear that our clean growth strategy and industrial strategies do provide the right frameworks for delivering net zero. So we will continue to deliver through them, including, for example, recent record low prices for offshore wind, the new future home standard, our CCUS action plan, 400 million investment in charging infrastructure for electric vehicles and 390 million for investment in hydrogen and low carbon technology to reduce emissions from industry. Finally, on Hinkley Point C, he will be aware, I'm sure, that there is no cost to the taxpayer. Ed Vasey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. May I welcome my right honourable friend to her post and may I, through her, thank uh, her excellent officials for the brilliant work they have done in replicating the Euratom uh, Treaty provisions and also for her department's continued support for nuclear fusion, which is such an important industry uh, in my uh, constituency. Can she assure me that in her no doubt very long tenure in this new post, she will continue to support investment and research in nuclear fusion where Britain helps to lead the world? Well, my honourable friend uh, raises a really important point that's very important in his constituency too, and I can assure him that uh, my department is looking very carefully at many different innovations, including nuclear fusion. Wait for a second. 
Ms. Red Miliband. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the Secretary of State to her post? And I know she is deeply committed uh, on this issue, and she certainly has a big task in front of her. I want to ask her about the strategy for COP26, which is obviously a very, very important moment, not just for Britain, but for the world. We are going to be trying to persuade other countries, uh, Europe, we're going to be trying to persuade India, China and others to ramp up their ambition for 2030 because the IPCC has told us we have 10 years to turn around the path of emissions. Can I therefore suggest to her that as well as having a net zero target for 2050, we ourselves need to ramp up our ambition for 2030? Will she therefore ask the Committee on Climate Change to look not just at the pathway to 2050 or to, uh, in 2030, but what more we can do as a country so we can persuade others to follow us? Yeah. Well, the, the right honourable gentleman raises a really important point, and he will uh, no doubt expect that is exactly the kind of area we're looking at. There obviously needs to be a pathway. You can't just suddenly decarbonise on 2049. So we are looking now at the trajectory, at the development of different technologies, how quickly we can deploy them, what the choices are to get the best value for taxpayers' money, while setting a real example that we can demonstrate for COP26 next year. Neil Parrish. Air quality is very much part of climate change, and we must increase our air quality in this country. So, more electric cars uh, linked to actually being charged up at night will actually use up a lot of renewable energy and store it. So, there's a, there's a great advantage to driving that, those technologies because we must have better air quality in this country. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for his question. Of course air quality is vital and the move to electric vehicles is very important. He'll be aware that we have a £400 million investment in charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, but also vital is that we are generating electricity from low carbon sources to provide that electricity for those electric vehicles. Sir Ed Davey. Mr Speaker, does the Secretary of State agree that the climate emergency demands we reform the whole financial system to decarbonise capitalism and green the city? If so, why is the Government taking three years to implement mandatory disclosure of climate-related financial risks when it could be brought in within one year? Um, well, the Right Honourable Gentleman will be aware that um, the Prime Minister just this weekend doubled our international climate finance contribution from £5.8 billion to £11.2 billion between 2021 to 2025, which I think demonstrates our commitment to providing support for those in developing, in developing countries. Anne-Marie Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Secretary of State might be interested that it's not just Greta Thunberg, but also the young people in my constituency in Newton Abbott, who are absolutely determined to have a, a voice in this climate change issue. And uh, they themselves, uh, they attend Torquay Grammar School, uh, have got on YouTube um, something which has gone viral, but they want to know how they can get involved. Could you tell my constituents what they need to do, how they can engage with government, to have young people's voices heard? Yeah, my honourable friend raises such an important point. There are so many young people taking part in, in um, demonstrations and wanting to know what they can do to help. We will be having Green GB Week um, early in the new year, and that will be a great opportunity for schools to really get involved and young people to give their views. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the commitment to double the aid spending on international climate <laughs> finance. But A, it has to be new money, and B, the government has to be consistent. It makes no sense to be giving on one hand, but then investing in fossil fuels in the other. Uh, my right honourable uh, friend on the front bench just raised the issue of the 96% of export credit finance going to energy projects, going to fossil fuel energy projects. That makes no sense at all. And that's, he, she says we need a transition, but for developing countries, that's locking them into dependence on fossil fuels for decades to come. It is not a transition. So will she look into stop doing that in the future? Well, I think the Honourable Lady will be delighted to hear about the Ayrton Fund, which is a billion pounds for providing that transition from fossil fuels, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, from using kerosene lamps and coal-fired coal stoves and so on, into using solar power for cooking and heating and lighting. These are a genuine opportunity for developing economies to transition early. 
Alex Chalk. The Speaker, British carbon emissions are down by 42% on 1990 levels, which is a fantastic achievement, but we're responsible for just 1% of global emissions and emissions overall are rising. What can the international community do to ensure that those polluters like India and China, responsible for nearly 30% of global emissions, uh, clean up their act? Um, it's absolutely clear that this has to be a global effort. The UK as my honourable friend rightly points out, is responsible for a small proportion of global emissions, and those emissions continue to rise. So it's incumbent on all of us to follow the instruction of the Paris Climate Change Agreements and to try to encourage to do everything we can to lead the way as we are doing from the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Barry Chairman. Speaker, can I urge the Secretary of State, uh, who is a persuasive woman, will she persuade every member of Parliament, Lords and Commons, to read Professor Steve Jones' new book, Here Comes the Sun? It is compelling about the fragility of our planet and what human beings are doing to it. Will she do that? And will she also wake up the CPA and the IPU? We as legislators should be persuading around the world our fellow legislators to move on this and let's share their technology with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that the Honourable Gentleman isn't the manager of this particular book and taking a commission on everyone's souls. Obviously, that could give me a conflict of interest, but nevertheless, I totally take his point. We need to be shouting from the rooftops, and we've got so many brilliant young people out there doing that for us, but he's right. We all need to do all we can to tackle this. Mark Richard. Can I welcome the Government's commitment to net zero for 2050 whilst uh, uh, creating jobs, mostly uh, green jobs, I'd like to see from the uh, paper uh, today. Um, but can I ask what the Government's rationale is for not uh, agreeing with the opposition for a 2030 target? Well, um, my honourable friend will realise, and, and here I'm, I regret to say that the 2030 target that Labour have announced is simply not credible, and the Institute for Fiscal Studies have said it is almost certainly impossible. Um, as Paul Johnson said, we need zero emissions. Getting there by 2050 is tough and expensive, but feasible and consistent with avoiding most damaging climate change. Aiming for zero emissions by 2030 is almost certainly impossible, hugely disruptive, and risks undermining consensus. So I do urge us to continue to work cross-party on 2050 zero emissions. Ben Lake. Secretary of State rightly emphasised the need to urgently decarbonise our economy. In that regard, would the government consider looking again at the contribution the tidal lagoon project might make to decarbonising our energy supply, and perhaps whether the regulated asset-based model might be a way of financing the development? I think um, the Honourable Gentleman may have raised this like four years ago. <laughs> yes, we've been talking about this for a long time. As he will know, there have been a lot of consideration of the potential of tidal power. It is incredibly expensive and was ruled out on those grounds. Uh, we are looking at a regulated asset-based model for financing of big energy, um, energy efficient projects and we will continue to keep that under review, but it has to, of course, offer good value for taxpayers' money. So this path to net zero that we are setting out will enable further opportunities to consider different technologies. Mary Robinson. Speaker, I welcome the, the launch of the Ayrton Fund and the £1 billion going into uh, the creation of new technologies. We're all, we also have a proud history of um, commitment to, to developing countries in international aid. How will this fund fit into our existing commitments? Uh, well, as my honourable friend knows, the UK Government has committed to spending 0.7% of our national income on aid, and analysis does show that without urgent action on climate change, development progress is at risk. So tackling climate change and protecting the environment is bound up with development, so it's right that it has to be a priority for UK aid. It also is very important that the OECD criteria for official development assistance includes addressing climate change, and so that's what we're doing. Mary McCarthy. 
Mr Speaker. The um, Secretary of State talks about this £140 million package for protecting and restoring forests around the world, which is all well and good, but if we're still bound in to the trade in beef and livestock feed from the Amazon, we are contributing to the problem. When is she going to say something about that? Yeah. Well, as the Honourable Lady will know, that would be a matter for comment by the DEFRA Secretary of State, and I'm sure the opportunity to raise that with her will come up at DEFRA questions soon. Richard Graham. Speaker, holding the UN Climate Change Summit 2020 in Glasgow was a great success for Anglo-Italian diplomacy and also highlights an advantage for Scotland in being a member of the United Kingdom with some 30,000 attendees expected. I do not share the Shadow Secretary's concern about the billion pounds coming from our International Development Fund. Would my right honourable friend confirm that one of the advantages of this money is that it can be used to help to save forests in Indonesia, and would she agree with her department to continue the good work of our climate change unit there? Well, my, my honourable friend is exactly right. We're all delighted that the uh, COP. Uh, 26 is going to be held in Glasgow. We shall all be there. It will be a great opportunity to visit Scotland as part of a stronger United Kingdom post-Brexit. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we all very much look forward to it. And my honourable friend is exactly right that the, that the Ayrton Fund offers a fantastic opportunity to contribute to low-carbon technologies for use in developing economies. Anna McMorrin. Can I start by saying it's good to see the Secretary of State here today in her place and allowing us the opportunity here today to, to question her government on climate change, which we didn't think we were going to have the opportunity to do. Data from Antarctica suggests the onset of irreversible ice sheet instability, which could see sea level rise by several metres. This was not the future my father envisaged for his children when he spent years working in, the, in Antarctica over 40 years ago, and it's not what I want for my children. So can I ask why this government is so reluctant to show leadership in setting hard and fast targets, particularly on the tried and tested technologies of onshore wind and solar? Um, well, can I thank the Honourable Lady for her um, collegiate approach to this, and I think we should attempt to continue in that vein. She'll be aware that we have over 10 gigawatts of onshore wind capacity in the UK, and she'll also no doubt be aware that we had a very successful Contracts for Difference round just a couple of weeks ago on offshore wind, um, showing sub £40 per megawatt hour cost, which is extraordinary. When I was um, Energy Minister only a few a few years ago, the cost of CFDs then was about £150 a megawatt hour. So these are extraordinary. The UK is really leading the world. We should be proud of that. And of course, we will continue to look at all renewable technologies. Robert Hill. The yeah, Conservative Environment Network recently produced its manifesto, and one of the proposals in there for a quick win on emissions was to increase the amount of ethanol in petrol up to 10% which would also help the British bioethanol industry, farmers and uh, us all. Uh, is that something that uh, she's looked at? Could she encourage the uh, Secretary of State for Transport to do it? Because it would be equivalent to taking 700,000 cars off the road. Um, I am aware of the um, idea that my honourable friend mentions, and in fact what I can tell him is I'll be meeting with the Secretary of State for Transport very soon to talk about how we can speed up the decarbonisation of the transport system, and that I'm sure will certainly be something we discuss. Okay. The uh, right honourable ladies mentioned the involvement of young people. One of the demands of the Student Climate Network is to reform the curriculum to reflect the ecological crisis as an educational priority. Has she or will she discuss that with the Secretary of State for Education? I think the Honourable Gentleman makes a very good point, and I haven't discussed it yet with the Secretary of State for Education, but I certainly will make a point of doing so. James Gray. Yeah. 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 Last time I looked, the Honourable Gentleman was called Luke Graham rather than James Gray. Yeah. Uh, grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. <laughs> and, easy, easy mistake to make, Mr Speaker. And, and I, I, I say, say the Honourable Gentleman of Ockhill and South Perthshire, he's, he's a few years younger. James Gray. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir, but I myself was brought up in Auckland, South Perth, so we have a great deal in common, albeit a slight age difference. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, one way in which the UK can truly lead the world in this generational battle against uh, climate change is through climate science, in particular polar science. And certainly I pay tribute to the Honourable Lady for Nor- Norfolk North's father, who was a, a glacier named after him, Morin Glacier, uh, in Antarctica. Will the Right Honourable Lady join me in congratulating British scientists and universities and, and institutions throughout Britain who make a vast contribution to polar and, and, and climatic science? And will she today of all days pay, pay tribute to the fact that the uh, SS um, uh, David Attenborough is today being launched in, in Birkenhead uh, and perhaps in passing make passing tribute to the great man himself? What about voting with both? Well, um, yes, what? indeed, Boaty McBoatface what? launching today. Yes, the RSS David Attenborough, yeah, and yeah. I was always delighted to pay tribute to David Attenborough because I think he really, as I said in my early remarks, his his um, series on our Earth and our oceans has really brought home to so many people the urgent need for action. Um, and I would also like to pay tribute to my honourable friend himself because he has been a bit of a Arctic explorer and has done a great deal to highlight climate change himself and I think we should be grateful to him for that. Tim Farron. Speaker, if we're serious about tackling climate change, we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And to that end, will she agree with me that the proposal for the West Cumbria coal mine should be cancelled? Will she speak to her Sir Friend, the Secretary of State for Local Government, to whom I have written? And will she instead commit government money through the Northern Powerhouse to create renewable industry energy jobs in the West Cumbria instead? Well, I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman is as delighted as I am that we have moved from 40% reliance on coal to only 5% today, and that is quite an achievement. And he raised a very important point about fossil fuels. He'll be aware that we are looking at carbon capture usage and storage action plan with projects designed to try and improve our use of fossil fuels and to make them lower carbon. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, and we'll continue to look at how we can make that work. Graham. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, having been part of the Cabinet Office team that pushed for Glasgow to host COP26, can I thank my honourable friends for pu- coming through with this commitment to make sure that one of our greatest cities in the United Kingdom can showcase the fantastic commitments we're making and how yeah, we're developing yeah. world leading technology. Yeah, yeah. But it's not just internationally where we're making our name known, Mr. Speaker, it's also locally with UK government investments in the International Environment yeah, Centre yeah. in Alloa and a world leading recycling facility being built in South Perthshire. Ah. This is great progress over the last two years, but can I ask my roundable friend to meet with me to take the next step to bring geothermal energy and smart grids to Clackmanninshire? Well, my honourable friend is uh, tempting me to make some budgetary commitments that I don't have the ability to do right now, but I'm always delighted to talk to him about his brilliant ideas for his own constituency and the surrounding area. Brock. Our government in Scotland is consulting on public sector climate change responsibilities and reporting duties. Can the Secretary of State advise us what work her department will be doing with UK public bodies based in Scotland as their emissions will count against our world leading targets? The Honourable Lady will be aware that there are regular and frequent discussions between officials at all levels on how to meet our carbon commitments. Those will continue and I would say will be increased in the road to COP26 next year, so there will be plenty of opportunities for cross-nations collaboration. Dr Matthew Alford. It's been reported that 38% of Americans believe that uh, we currently face a climate crisis. It's a slightly smaller number than the number of Americans who believe that aliens walk amongst us. So can the uh, Secretary of State tell us um, what she's doing to actually encourage all countries to treat climate change as a priority? Well, my honourable friend, as a number of honourable members have done, has raised the very important point about the need for global action. And what I can say is that in seeking to host COP26 in Glasgow, as we have done, we are demonstrating our determination to be part of the solution and to try to lead other nations into showing the same level of commitment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in answer to my honourable friend, the member for Bristol East's question, the Secretary of State said she couldn't answer that because it was a matter for DEFRA, which I understand. So will she join the call from the schools of Bristol and the school children of Bristol and ask the Prime Minister to bring back the Department of Climate Change. 
Well, I am obviously um, delighted to be fulfilling the role as uh, Secretary of State for Energy as well as for Business. I can clearly see the link between the amazing UK-led science and innovation and the need for commercialisation of many of the solutions that tackle climate change. So I actually feel very comfortable with the way that the Department is, is now um, managed. Um, she makes a very important point about the specifics of the portfolio that DEFRA holds, but I do think there will be an opportunity at oral questions. Dr Julian Lewis. Do we have a policy of using our very large international aid budget as a means of incentivising other countries to improve their climate change policy? Yes, well, my honourable friend will be aware that in our recently published Green Finance Strategy, we committed to aligning all UK overseas development aid with the Paris Agreement so that our development finance is consistent with climate resilient and low greenhouse gas development pathways. We urge all nations to do likewise. Liam Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to follow the point made by my right honourable friend, the member for Doncaster North, because he's right to say we're not going to be a leader abroad unless we're a leader at home. Now, in the West Midlands, we've been a leader of industrial revolutions for three centuries, but we need a green development corporation to build the homes. We need municipal energy companies to roll out the solar. We need a regional investment bank to roll out climate finance here at home. Give us the tools, and we'll show the leadership. Well, we do have a number of actions that we've already taken around charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, investments in hydrogen, low carbon technology to reduce emissions from industry. There's a lot more that we will be doing and we'll be setting out our plans in the next few weeks. Maria Caulfield. HMRC is having to change VAT rates from 5 to 20 per cent for the installation of renewables such as solar panels. This is to meet the EU VAT directive. Once we've left the EU, will the Minister commit to reversing this decision? Yes, she is of course right. We will be able to choose our own VAT rates. Order, I'm sorry, but we must now move on.